Hey, how y'all doing? Let's do it to it. Okay, we'll do five puzzles and then we'll uh, get on to Jeremy Selman. Resume. Okay. <clears throat> so here it comes over there. G5, check, king, e7. Ah, if here, here, then we have that there. It comes down. Now we gotta we gotta take a consideration. Queen F8, then King um, E. Take here, he takes and it's mate. Bishop takes, rook takes, knight check, wins the... <clears throat> there we go. Here, there, there, and I'm thinking we almost have a uh, checkmate. Knight here, and then that would be me. So the rook has to actually take.
root takes here. If Cain takes, Cain takes, Cain takes, Cain takes, and you're basically winning at this point. Bishop takes, and then Queen takes check, and you win the knight. Okay, we'll stop here, and we'll get into our Jeremy Soma now. Well, this is uh, a new section that we're entering. It's called Wayne Lee into Opening Chaos. So the way to, basically it's what he's saying is the way to into the opening, understanding the opening without too much chaotic, uh, you know, in your minds. So let's do that. You, and this is what he says. Usually you'll find yourself in an opening of your cho of your choosing. Sometimes you prefer to uh, prefer beforehand, though, or you prepare you prepare beforehand. Though whether the that preparation is deep or shallow is up to your strength, experience, and work ethic. Which means you should already know um, some exceptions of that opening. And the main imbalances, the ideas, the plans. On the other hand, your opponent might surprise you in in that opening. So, what we're going to do is go over an uh, opening kind of idea. That let me see if there's a name for this. We'll just do. It. We'll just name it this. For example, he says, sometimes your opponent will uh, throw you off with b4, as, as sometimes is played. But normally, what is played is e, uh, uh, e4, e5, knight, and then d5. Uh, drives you into something you're, uh, that you're clueless about. This also will drag you into something you're not sure about here. In the first case, uh, etc., you get an opening you're familiar with. You should do fine, since even if your opponent leaves, uh, they're, they're, unless they, if they know some theory, at some point you'll be able to make moves that are seriously are sensible and good and full, and in, in accordance uh, with uh, the imbalances for that opening. Your opponent will maybe have maybe half as much or almost as much as you but you're three or four moves further in the theory you'll be able to play more sensible more in uh, to the position of the opening and you'll be able to um, outplay your opponent because you'll know that opening scenario into the middle game okay for the upcoming middle game, that's what he says. Uh, things can get a bit more taxing if you end up in an undiscovered uh, country. Uh, basically, the board, if you like the B4 move, if white plays B4, that's an odd line. You might throw most players into um, kind of a tizzy. 
but if you have a good understanding that b4 isn't really the best move and it could be um, taken advantage of and you just play an imbalance and you get into a position that you're used to you should be able to take advantage of that though if some positional lines then you should get a fine I'll say uh, a discovered country though through though if it's some positional line then you should get a fine but similar return to an imbalance roots. So basically what he's saying there is that even if you kind of don't know where you're going, just switch to imbalances and you'll find the, the way through. For example, after B, B4, here we go, you realize that white is gaining queen side space and also attending to play bishop B2. Pretty simple. You can say, okay, he took queen side space, so I'll take something too. Now, how about the center? How about the center? And so you'll go, ah, b5. Makes perfect sense. Then you would continue going for the center and strive to make your center indestructible, like what we talked about. While, uh, he, while your opponent would attack um, on the queen side, you attack in the center and try to continue making, and they'll try to continue making queen side space, you'll make king side and you, we, it all goes down to even if you don't know the theory behind B4 but your approach would be ensured for an balanced fight so basically what you're doing is if they play B4 you can always go back to principles which is uh, central control and let's say they play something like A3 A3 here you can play B, B5 and if then they play bishop there, you could play knight. You have to be careful um, that uh, you don't um, have a problem with your knight getting kicked out. So you may have to first play uh, d4. Then if they play uh, e3, you can actually play c5 here and kind of go into a line like this and after takes bishop takes 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 you have an isolated pawn controls that so what you could do is potentially um, play there takes and if bishop takes and it comes out Castles. Knight comes out. Rook over. Castles. If uh, if that gets played, you could take, take, and then takes, and then you get into a position where Black's actually uh, better. It's kind of really interesting that after that, all that line, that Black's actually better. Harder to deal with. Uh, harder to deal with is some tactical surprises in the opening. In this case, rational thought in the imbalances he's saying might have to take back seat uh, to raw calculation. However, just because your opponent tries to drag you down the the rabbit hole doesn't mean you have to go that way. The following shows such a situation. This is a Jeremy Silman game. So we're going to pull up a Jeremy Silman game. There we go. You can, uh, you don't have to go down that, uh, that route that they want you to go down. Remember, you, it's all up to you. You, you have one side of the board too.
So d4, g6, e4. Remember, it's just plain uh, take the center. Bishop g, uh, knight f3, c6. Knight c3, d5, h3, knight here, e5, 4. Annoying in the, I was dimly aware of some analyze, analysis covering knight takes here which is always to uh, try to activate via uh, knight to e4, that type of play when you push. <clears throat> C5 but I didn't really remember any of the details. My opponent had made a six move instantly and seemed quite pleased with himself. And it was clear that I knew exactly what would uh, be going on after the capture on e4. Though I had no problem fighting players on the stage of this, of this kind of choosing. It's, it had to be fair in the position had to be in that I felt I could outplay anyone in the positional fight this positional fight as long as uh, we le can let these imbalances as long as we can let those imbalances lead us to the promised land all should be well well I also was confident of being able to find the right tactical against some type of uh, he, he calls it a uh, not good opening. It's to be tactically uh, refuted. But this knight e4 was difficult, was different. The complications were far from clear and if he had, if he was uh, booked up to the, to the hilt basically, then I would be uh, a fool to walk into his preparation. Effectively, instead of playing uh, Mr. Hanks, I would be playing a team of Grand Masters analysis. So consider all this. My decision was easy to understand after he uh, played knight to e4. Bishop d3 was what was actually played in the game. Avoiding this tactical preparation and forcing a different strategic battle now. Now the winner will be the player with the most skills, not the player with the best memory. The psychology of stepping away from the sharp opening surprise the surprise with a calm move that keeps the position uh, this, uh, sane, basically, that it's not going to be crazy or tactical or berserking-like. And the and imbalance friendly, of course, has served me well on many occasions. I recognize you uh, make use of it. I, he says, I recommend you make use of this type of a position. So the knight takes here, b takes, and then c5. And then castles with a uh, slight p uh, pull for white though my it says though I didn't really leap into the rabbit hole of uh, op options the psychology shows it's worth shows it's worth over the course of my career So if you, basically what he's saying here is he he played these subtle 
um, imbalance is not the not these tactical brute force knockout ones. If he would have taken, he would have walked into his opponent's preparation, my friends. And then it would have been really um, who had the best memory. And he, he didn't want to go down that route. So he just kept it very um, uh, structural to what he wanted. Like if Black were to play this move here, this here, all Jeremy Simmel would do is retreat back to e2 and then bring a rook to b1, get the bishop out uh, a3. And he would have some really fine positions. He says, here's a case in point. He actually stopped at this point. He's going to uh, pull up another um, one where he played a, a whole game. Perfect. Let's pull up another board. So we kind of, you kind of get the idea if your opponent plays some off the, so I like to say off the wall moves, you can always just play the imbalances. Don't, whatever you do, do not panic. Because that's the worst thing you can actually, uh, do for your position is to panic. I just got to change one thing. I made a, a slight error in an A. There you go. I appreciate your patience on that. Now we're going to get into it. So d4, d5, c4, e5. Just two moves and black managed to push his d-pawn and e-pawn to their fourth rank. Here answering e5 with the quiet move of either knight c3, uh, e3, etc just wouldn't uh, cut it it since blacks pawn center and easy development ensures him a good game would you uh, let black have two after just two moves get away with uh, what his what he wanted all that yeah, right away would you let him do that right away no no black has demanded too much, too fast, and a guy has to draw the line in the sand at some point. So Jeremy Stillman says, we're drawing a line in the sand here. D takes. <clears throat> I didn't know much about the Albin counter gambit theory. I spent my uh, time studying more mainstream openings. But the uh, the, the dice had been laid basically you know uh, if you have like a six-sided die when you throw the dice out whatever numbers those dice come up one to six it's been played so he basically says with uh, the Albin counter game it being played on move two the the scene or the screenshot of the movie has been laid and he has to he has to act he can't be passive because that would allow black to get all of the center <clears throat> a freeing position so you have to take you have to go through it that, uh, to accept uh, that my dreams quite positional struggle wasn't going uh, to come true so he wanted a positional struggle not uh, out with counter gamut now my mood swung to one of the do or die positions uh, he would follow with space gaining d4 and then try and build up a, an attacking position and I would welcome the fight by mixing th the energy and development with raw overwhelming greed. So what he has to do is he has to allow this one move to um, come to pass. d5. 
RT4. This is kind of the whole point of the Albion counter gambit. Is you're gambiting one pawn to play d4 to uh, clamp down on the position and then play uh, c5. Knight f3 to attack the pawn. Knight uh, c6. This guards the pawn and attacks that pawn. g3. Oops, not b3. g3. Bishop uh, g4 to uh, attack the knight. Bishop g2. Bishop d7. Uh, he wanted to castle queen side. This could be played here. And then bishop takes, knight takes, bishop takes. So you get a kind of, this is kind of the Albin counter position that you get, and then you would just retreat back. You're playing now against his fractured pawns. You're still up a pawn. So that's why he played uh, bishop, I mean queen d2. He wants to actually castle kingside, or queenside, and then take the bishop and grab the pawn. I mean, the bishop takes knight, then grab the pawn after castle queenside. White castled, and then h5, queen b3, go after the pawn. Remember, imbalances. Everything has a drawback. Knight g to uh, e7, bishop g5. I know what you're thinking. Why not take here, right? The problem is, I believe you get your bishop um, trapped at this point. I'm thinking uh, it's not that move. I'm thinking it's this move here. Kind of a little awkward. It could have went down that line, but he didn't want to go into and too much at one time. H4. Blacks attack, attacking like a uh, madman. But this, uh, but is it the, uh, is he offering me basically a second pawn? I'm willing to put up with a lot of the, uh, with two pawns, so he's going for more greed. So he takes, <clears throat> oops, not that, bishop takes. I felt like I was in at the all-you-can-eat uh, buffet, that's what he is just saying, with pawns. He's, he's, the, he's got two pawns up, and his opponent is, is two pawns down. Knight g6. Bishop g5, rook h5, knight bd2, bishop b4, rook uh, d, uh, let's see, f d1. The theme of this game is obvious. He He's playing some hyper-aggressive moves, and I either develop another piece or uh, devour something. That's the position. <clears throat> F3, really, you want me to take something else? That's what's going through his mind. And so he's like, okay, I'll take something. Okay, there's a third pawn. Now show me what you got. That's basically what's going through his mind. Castles. There goes another pawn. I never realized that chess was such... He says it's a joke. This is a joke. Easy game. Of course, you're still uh, living in the world of imbalances. That's what he's saying. So even though the opponent's down a tremendous amount of pawns, remember, all the files to White's King are open. So it may look like, oh, look, you know, you have, uh, 
you have all these pawns, we'll say four pawns up, but if uh, black can get their pieces active and in attacking, you know, position, it could be really hard. But if you, as a chess player, can stop their counterplay, neutralize everything, you can then take those four pawns and turn them into a tremendous advantage in an endgame. We're still in one of balance. Trying to get to my king for him. It's dynamic or bust. And I'm swallowing uh, down everything that he offers me. So he's basically eating everything. White is um, in a sweet sta uh, static taste. Basically what's happening is white is, um, you know how there's a static advantage and then a dynamic advantage? White has a static, which is a long-term advantage, where uh, black is trying for a static instant uh, attack. All in are basically do or die. That's what I like to say. Rook g8. <clears throat> Knight e4. Queen takes uh, g7 h4 a case of too many good choices bishop f6 uh, was probably best while um, actually bishop f6 knight uh, f6 rook takes knight takes was also um, strong though a tad complex, but try, but why risk anything? I decided to lock in the victory by uh, basically battering down the kingside hatches. And so that's why he played um, h4. Bishop by e7. It's not d7. Bishop e7. Bishop takes e7. Queen takes e7. Knight takes d4. Four pawns. In the, and he's very satisfied with that. Bishop d. Queen a3. Of course, black can't afford to trade queens, so knight takes, rook takes, c5, rook d5, Figured out root takes d uh, is that this is actually a crippling move at this point. This game center match because what would happen is after this, the knight would jump into f6 and what on what in the world could happen? Keeping things on the open in path are uh, for you are in familiarity, which is a good practice and rule of thumb. However, when your opponent uh, tries to bust, basically smash into you like um, headbutts or punching, you have to be ready to block and go right back at them. Starting with the immediate theory, um, yes, yeah, sometimes have to uh, go all in. Take, as, as Jeremy Silma says, you have to take the sword out and start, uh, start the battle and get in there and leap at the challenge. At this point uh, with d5, he, he actually resigned here. His opponent resigned. White is better. Close to almost winning. So just keep that in your forefront. See how we're doing on time. Perfect. We'll read this and then uh, we'll see what how much time we have left we have a, this is our ending section that we're going over this is the final one it's a summary wrap up the imbalances are a critical tool for approaching 
for uh, preparing an understanding of any and all opening systems. I'll repeat that one more time. The imbalances are a critical tool for uh, proper understanding of any and all opening systems. Two, choosing openings that suit your style, temperament, just because the world's best players use it doesn't mean that it's right for you. Three, choosing openings that suit both your schedule and your memory. Four, choose, uh, choosing openings that uh, cater to your chest strength, etc. If you play closed positions really well, go for a system that tends to lock up the center. If you are a if you are a strong positional player, but don't always uh, keep up in sharp tactical situations, pick lines that avoid chaos. If uh, tactic chaos. If tactics is what you're all about, make sure your opening choices are conductive uh, to that particular talent. So if you like more gambits, like those type of things, tactical, that's what he's trying to say in five. Choose openings that make you happy. This might sound a tad strange, but if the position you acquire from the opening doesn't make you feel excited, excited, happy, or at least our at the very least deeply satisfied then why in the world are you using th those systems that's number five number six is <clears throat> don't choose openings based on the uh, um, opinion of others are on chess uh, notations like uh, equal um, slightly better for white you know symbols like these down here well, 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 oops right here like what we're talking about like these symbols here don't just choose openings based on the those okay don't do that or on computer um, <clears throat> basically assertions even if the position is thought to be mi uh, mildly better for the other side that doesn't mean that it's uh, fully playable it's a fully playable position often a player is unfamiliar uh, for in the position and is far it's far more important that it is a representation based on what you like to play yeah it offers a player an uh, inf um, a uh, this also this one more thing that he says it offers a play player on you know like you have an infinity for a position for a particular position is far more important than than its uh, reputation. So if you have an affinity for a position, the rep and it's better that you like that position and go for it, even if it has a representation of being slightly better for your opponent. Basically, if you like it, then play it. If you wish to create a uh, temper, a temperament uh, learning repertoire based on facing and fixing your weaknesses then you either consider these three uh, things choose openings that don't uh, suit your style slash temperament choose openings that cater to your uh, chess weaknesses choose openings that basically make you panic and out and leave you feeling vulnerable and insecure that that's not good that's not good so what he's trying to say is if you wish to create a uh, a learning curve type of thing you have to kind of have a repertoire based on fixing your weaknesses even though these uh, it may for a while make you feel kind of uncomfortable you sometimes have to go down certain openings like uh, playing a D let's say you're an E4 player playing D force will help you uh, even if you don't like it and you kind of get panicked worried just play it, get used to it. And so when you switch back, we uh, studied a player, John Nunn, who actually was an E4 uh, player. And uh, his coach told him to switch to be a D4. He didn't do very well at first, but then he started improving and improving. And then he went, when he went back to his E4 play, he was able to be um, more... He was more comfortable when lines kind of went positional because he knew how to handle them. Whether your opening is dynamic or static, closed or open, you need full understanding 
a full understand that okay you need to fully understand the inner uh, play of imbalances that your opening offers you so you have to understand what your openings uh, offer you the opening and kind of the imbalances an opening battle between two theoretical assert uh, basically assertion players will ultimately boil down to a psych the psychology of differences of opinions but if you don't know the psychology the imbalances and the general idea behind your opening lines then you'll be left with random moves and remember what we, remember what we talked about last time I think it was three lessons ago random moves are not the best moves if you know how a position will end up then you'll be able to play the best moves and this is the last one you always need to know what your opening is giving you and what it's giving your opponent and that's perfect we'll stop here so you have to always you have to remember those uh, what the what we summarized up on so you know what we have to keep in the forefront that you know what study is important um, if you like an opening <clears throat> but you you know the, uh, with a lot of variations but you don't have a lot of time pick an opening that will serve you well that you don't have to learn a lot of theoretical lines in and you'll still be able to play chess and enjoy it but still do um, kind of what life uh, has for you to do like a job and stuff like that and so that you, you don't have <laughs> unless you make it like your profession you uh, will have to give here and take here so that means you have to kind of go for a more of a if you're a positional player pick an opening that is positional but you may not want to play but your time only allots you to have that so you got to kind of got to do that and so just uh, you know what and always remember to have fun that's the whole point it all comes down to critical decisions and the most critical decision that you will ever make even more than over the board is will you choose Jesus Christ to be your, your Lord and Savior of your life that's the that's the whole point critical critical choice will you choose the cross of Christ Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior this, that's it because eternity is a long time we talk about that all the time that we can't even comprehend, comprehend how long it is and uh, that's what Bruce is saying why you take what you know from chess and you apply it to what we always talk about the Lord Jesus Christ in receiving him and you remember to treasure your victories and learn from your losses remember that mistakes do uh, do not um, yeah treasure your victories learn from losses and mistakes do not ma make up who you are it's how you handle the mistake that makes up who you are and that's uh, about vital importance of uh, the position at hand and you have to remember that that you know what you're not always going to uh, be a hundred percent and make all the right decisions but you can always rely on the choice to receive the Lord Jesus as the ultimate one especially through these uh, trying times in the world right now to know where you're gonna go after uh, after we get old and you know depart to be of the Lord is a vital thing of confidence that you can always take with you but remember the team chess cruncher ma uh, motto and why we study what we do is because of this we hang up our coats we hang up our hats we sit down and study when most won't team chess cruncher does and that makes all the difference and as Wesley so says serve the Lord Jesus as I say God bless and I'll see you next time on chess cruncher TV have a blessed morning afternoon evening and Lord will I'll be back on tomorrow we'll keep pushing forward and remember what Hannibal Smith said even inside of a rant what looks like a random position what Jeremy Selman we went over there's always an imbalance and when you find it and you get to implement the the really good imbalance you get to say I love it when a plan comes together okay two thumbs up who Robbie blessed I pray you receive the Lord Jesus Lord Savior of your life and if you did good job and I will see you tomorrow team chess cruncher go team chess cruncher hoorah stay strong bye bye